Hi, I'm Ernie Conover, and today I thought we'd talk a little bit about skew chisels, or really just turning chisels in general. We did this today as a Zoom session, however, the recording I was extremely dissatisfied with. Both cameras didn't come across well, so I'm just reshooting it as a straight video for your enjoyment. A skew chisel is no more than a rectangular blank of steel with the edge slightly skewed about a 25 to 30 degree angle to the axis of the tool. And it is double beveled. It is ground from both sides to as fine an angle as about 30 degrees. Any traditional skew such as this one can benefit from a little bit of tuning. I like to just grind the edges off like this on a grinder so that they aren't sharp. The reason being the sharp edge because you only put the corner on the tool rest while you're turning and it has to slide along like this. It will catch and you won't be able to move it smoothly. Also, applying a little paraffin wax to both the tool rest and the skew will make it operate a little better in most cases. Many people today use the oval skew, which has been around since the 1980s. And it is what I recommend that students bring to a workshop. But instead of a rectangular section, it is oval on the two faces, coming down to narrow radius corner at the heel end. And that some more terminology, you have the toe or long corner and the heel or short corner. These uh, chisels are easier to roll beads with and most people just find them easier to use. They also can be ground to more acute angles for most beginners than they would handle with a rectangular section. This is the same chisel in an old Ashley Isles. I probably bought this sometime in the late 80s or early 90s, and it's still going strong. Uh, skew chisels, because you only sharpen them on wet stones, tend to have pretty good longevity. You can, in fact, find at flea markets and yard sales lots of old craftsman chisels, which were high-speed steel. It says high-speed steel right here. And they're rather short, but they're actually a very good chisel by just radiusing these corners a little, sharpening it well, it'll become a very good chisel uh, for your bank of tools. For the third edition of the lathe book, I was sent this new kind of skew from crown tool companies in Great Britain, and it is the invention of a turner named Colin, C-O-L-W-I-N, Colin Way, W-A-Y. And it does about the same thing as the oval skew. The reason the oval skew works a little better is with a traditional skew, you have the edge resting on the rest and the force out here in about the middle of the chisel. So it's always trying to lay it down flat on the rest. And when that happens, a catch occurs. The oval skew actually brings the contact with the wrist more like over here and the center of force is right here so they're much closer together and that makes this chisel work better. Colin Way's uh, chisel works on somewhat the same principle by wasting the tool that is putting a waste down in here and having it narrow you're bringing that contact point closer to the area where the center of force is. So better stability is the reason all of these work a little better. 
The skew is the one tool that works better with a flat bevel. And the only way I know to get a flat bevel on a normal bench grinder is to put it against the side of the wheel. Now most grinding manufacturers say to never sharpen on the side of a wheel. And yet I don't know of any old time machinist that doesn't do it now and then. And in fact, Sears used to sell a drill sharpening jig that used the side of the wheel. The thing they're worried about here is somebody putting a lot of pressure on the side of a narrow wheel that would explode and that would be dangerous. But if you keep this action to a one or one and a quarter inch wide wheel and you uh, put light pressure on the side of the wheel, it is not dangerous. That being said, I'd still use the shields and I'd still wear a face shield when I did it with a stone wheel. Fortunately, we have CBN wheels, which are cubit boron nitride, and these are made out of metal and they can't explode, so it's quite safe to grind on the side of a CBN wheel. I think they are one of the two greatest things to happen in sharpening in my lifetime, the other being the use of jigs of which the one way is the leading one on the market. I'll show you now quickly how I sharpen this. Um, you may find it useful to draw a pencil line at sort of an angle you want to sharpen it to on the two sides of the wheel so you can kind of get the same angle on the two sides like this. Before I grind this chisel, however, I'm going to switch to safety glasses, which are much stronger than street glasses. Uh, they have much deeper channels around the lenses that retain them if under impact, and they also have side shields, which keeps grinding particles from going around the glasses. I say, however, that with stone wheels, I still put a face shield on. It's one time I think a face shield is very important. So without further ado, I'll just start up the grinder and sharpen this chisel. And there. So I'd come over here. There's the second side. All your spindle turning tools benefit from a process I call honing. And we will take this now to a stone and refine this to a polished bevel and a very sharp edge. I do that on diamond plates these days. And this is a diamond plate that has fine on this side, extra fine on that side. And this one is an 8,000 mesh stone, which makes it a polishing stone about like a Japanese gold stone. So I put a little kerosene on, which is much cheaper than honing oil. And I work in circles. And you notice I'm holding that tool right up near the edge. Don't hold it back here behind, by the handle because you have no sense of feel. You want to get up here, rock down till you're on the bevel. I find circular motions to be much better than going back and forth like that because you tend to rock it and put more convex shape in the bevel. That doesn't hurt the cutting, but as you do it more and more, you're actually decreasing the angle of grind. 
making a much broader edge or larger angle. So now I just turn that over. And now I'll go over to this polished stone. There we go. Looks nice. Now it's time for us to go over to the lathe and show how the skew operates and how we can use it without catching. Oh, it's a daunting task. I'm making no attempt to conceal that we have cameras here. <laughs> you can see the other camera. So you'll be able to look from an audience view or over my shoulder, which is probably the best seat in the house. One thing a skew will do that no other tool does as well, and that's cut from square to round. You often want to leave a square at the top of a table leg or a, uh, a, a newel post for a banister, and you want to turn the rest of it round. And we do this by taking this bevel of the skew and making it at right angles to this piece of work. We work with our rest a bit high so that we cut out about here. We start up the lathe. I'm not going terribly fast, about a grand maybe. And with that bevel square to the shoulder, I'm going to touch down right there. And then I'm going to touch about a 30 seconds to the right. Go back to my first cut. Go to my second. Back to my first. And you can see that I've pretty well cut a square shoulder and broken through the flat spots of this turning. I actually cheated a little and I've cut about 1 32nd off the line. And so I have a little room to correct because I've actually got a slight curve to that. So I'll come back cutting right on the line again. There. There, we have a dead square shoulder. We're right on the line. And everything is hunky-dory. We'll now have to round the rest of this. Important detail of this cut is the fact that you make two cuts, really, that come to a V at the bottom, much like you would chop with an ax. If you don't clear wood out and have some place for the axe or the skew chisel to make a fresh cut, you're just going to jam the bit of the axe or this tool in the work and it can't cut. Two things can't occupy the same space at the same time. I've had students who just tried to shove this in hard. They turned, they got the tool so hot they turned the nose blue or the toe blue and smoke was coming off the wood. Uh, they created a Native American fire starting machine. Although you can make this round with a skew, the best tool for it is a roughing out gouge, which I covered the grinding of this two weeks ago. And this will make quick work of making this round. I'm almost round. I, at this point, often put my hand behind very lightly so I can feel when the flat spots go away. And you can also feel any bumps or waves in it. It's the best way to make a cylinder is just by feel. Mostly 
in furniture work, you don't leave this sharp square corner there. I've seen a few pieces that have that detail, but mostly you take a spindle gouge and you just roll a half bead on that corner, mostly in air. Down here I'm cutting all the time, but out here I'm cutting mostly air, so you have to have a steady hand for this, but it isn't hard to do and we've made this a much more beautiful shape. Now to our skew chisel. The way we're going to use it is put the corner down on the rest. I'd like the rest to actually be a little higher. There, that's about right. And I'm going to bring it down like this so it just cuts. Just slide it right along like that. It's given me a perfect cylinder and really a polished edge. You look at the fin surface finish here and here I got much better results out of the skew. Now Frank Payne in his iconic book of the 1950s, The Practical Woodturner, said that I know you only you bought all of this chisel but you can only use half of it and in fact you can only use a section from about here to about here and if you cut with much more of the edge than that you will be overwhelmed and a catch will happen and a catch happens when this comes off the bevel it starts to screw thread like that comes down and the point catches like that so we want to avoid that. So we're going to use about half the cutting edge. So there we are. You can see I'm cutting right in that area. I always say a skew walks backwards. You always want to lead with the heel. It cuts in the direction of the heel and the toe follows behind. There we go. Now there's another kind of cut with a skew and that is a heel cut. And if we were going to make, say, a somewhat French Empire style leg here and put a little ball foot on it, We'd want to create a shoulder right here, which we would do with our skew, taking a second cut. And now we would want to taper down to it. And so we would cut like this. And as we come up to this edge, we're going to slide on the bevel up till the very heel is cutting. And this trick is the secret to rolling a bead too. I'm cutting normal. I'm going into a heel cut. Going right like that. The beginner is better to start in the middle of any cylinder and cut off the edges like that. In fact, if you have to start on an edge, the heel cut is what gets you through that. You start like that, you come across, and then you go into a regular cut and right across and off the other edge. So, up into that heel cut. Good. You can also roll a bead with a skew and I'll show that in a minute, but I'd like to show you the oval skew now and why that is a little easier. I'm checking cameras here. Make sure they're still running. The oval skew, because we have this more stable base, it's just easier to come right along like that. We can go up into that heel cut. This gouge actually needs a trip to the oil stones. 
not leaving as good as finish as that other freshly sharpened one. And finally, Cohen Way's chisel does about the same thing. Up into that heel cut. And we could roll a bead with this by using that heel cut technique. There we go. Now, another member of the chisel family is the beading and parting tool, which is generally three eighths of an inch wide. And it will cut very nice beads as well. In fact, I think this is the best way there is to cut a bead. We're gonna use that double strike technique and create a rondelle right there that we could make this bead out of. And we just and I think it works a little better for most people because you can see the corner a little better. There are those that also roll a bead with the toe of the skew. It's more common in the British Isles, but you do it the same way. All this being said, I think the average person, myself included, I do a fair amount of architectural turning where I turn all oh, two or three up to maybe a hundred parts for someone and parts as long as 11 foot six inches and I just think it's much safer to roll it with a spindle gouge which you do like this and I can stop answer the telephone go back and finish the bead much more of a sense of feel and it's hard to get where you don't leave flat spots with a skew or a beading and parting tool so this will leave a, a much better shape in my estimation. So that's about it for the skew. Uh, great tool but it's a little bit like owning a, a, a falcon on a good day, the falcon goes out and catches a rabbit. You, you roast it together by the fire and uh, enjoy it. On a bad day, he doesn't come back with anything and bites you because he's just a little angry. Uh, and on a really bad day, he bites you, flies away, and never comes back. So, uh, you know, skews are a little like that. It takes some practice. They take more practice than other turning tools. And they also uh, are very strongly a sense of feel that it's like ice skating or riding a bike. And I find if I don't turn for two or three weeks, uh, I come out in the shop, it takes me a couple of hours to really get back in the groove. It takes me at least 15 minutes to get the feel back and a couple of hours to really get back in the groove. So uh, be patient with yourself and have fun. That's the important thing. And uh, thanks for visiting.